Well, this is one of those talks that the guest faculty are asked to give because it's a little esoteric. And although very dear to my research heart, this is an area of imaging that I'd like you to sit back and relax and listen to because I do believe that we are seeing a real shift now from structure to functional imaging. And so these are two well-known diseases that to date imaging has not played a role. And what I'm going to try and do for you is to give you an overview of the fact that the whole world of obstructive lung disease is actually changing. Uh, the overlapping uh, disease entities have been well known for years, but they've been diagnosed the same way for years. A symptom complex, pulmonary function tests, and somehow we separate out chronic bronchitics from emphysematous, from asthmatic patients. And it's quite clear with the advent of technology, imaging, CT, and genetic profiling, that the clinical cohorts are really very heterogeneous and that there's a lot that CT can do to identify which patients will benefit from a treatment where global lung function measures do not work. And that's really the take home message. So you can kind of relax and think about this afternoon already. But what I want to do is to take you through some evidence for that. We're going to look at quantitative image analysis. We're going to talk a little bit about how functional imaging analysis is done. And then we're going to look very carefully at where already we are seeing a complete change in uh, imaging both clinically and in drug trials. <clears throat> so what is the role of CT imaging? What diseases is it used for? What are those imaging protocols? And therapeutic clinical trials are really what has brought this to the forefront. Uh, there are a lot of new treatments, and the one that really brought this to the forefront was lung volume reduction surgery. There's a tremendous discussion now after a very expensive clinical trial as to which patients benefit from lung volume reduction surgery. And while some uh, thoracic surgeons and pulmonologists and radiologists feel this is a clearly worked out area, the reality of the New England Journal article was that very few patients did, but if you found those patients, they did extremely well. And that's led to a lot of interest. In the world of asthma, my former chairman of uh, pulmonology in South Africa who feels that I really did go wayward when after training in pulmonary and critical care, I forsook the peak flow meter that cost 25 cents for a CT scanner of 1.6 million to diagnose and evaluate asthma. And I'm going to show you why we think there's an important place for it and why the FDA has in fact adopted uh, some of these techniques. So the imaging procedure is a subtle difference. We suddenly have to think about function in the imaging suite. We're very used to the patients coming in and getting scanned, but we're not as used to the concept that we have to make sure that that lung volume is exactly at the same point each time. We, we kind of do it. We talk about asking patients to take a deep breath in and hold their breath at TLC, or as we saw in the previous talk, do some expiratory imaging. But the truth of the matter is we're not a lung function laboratory as a rule in the imaging department. We don't need to become a full pulmonary function lab, but we do need to think about how to do it so there's some validation. And here you see one of my most loyal research fellows who spent hours on a CT scanner and blew into a device that has a trigger that in fact triggered the scan to acquire images either at a certain lung volume or a certain initiation of flow. And to reward him, he's recently become a resident at UCLA. And what, what are we doing? The, the first thing is that the assessment that we can make from good CT data is that we are able to get very accurate and reproducible data from every single lung segment. Lung function tests, FEV1, FEC, TLCO, are all done with a tube in the mouth and are a global average of the lungs. And this is really where CT is extremely powerful and certainly MR has some potential here uh, in being able to give us regional assessments. What's also important is that we have to develop computer-aided techniques, and that's another area that's rapidly growing. We just saw how now we're looking at CAD and PE. Uh, certainly CAD is a critical part of lung nodule evaluations. We are soon going to have almost definitely scanners that come with packages that can do computer-aided diagnoses in diffuse lung disease as well and obstructive lung disease. There are a couple of steps that one has to go through, the one of which is low bar and lung segmentation. It's very important that you are able to do this. Uh, we and many others have developed segmentation tools. You see here with the very nice thin section scans, 0.75 or, or less collimation, we're able to get very good fishel definition. Uh, our program group 
headed, unfortunately, by an Australian guy, but that's not his fault, does a very nice job in putting together contours, but insists on using Australian rugby colors and uh, sporting colors in all his uh, work. But here you see a very critical step that's required. The next thing that's important is that we take into account the lungs physiology, West's zones, uh, where the gravitational effect is very important in both ventilation and perfusion. And so we can take a lobe or a segment or what we used to do, a whole lung, uh, and take it into its anterior, middle, and posterior uh, uh, components. Let's talk a little bit about asthma. Why in the heck would you have a CT scanner diagnose asthma? Well, the answer is you would not do it for a large proportion of patients. But there is a not insignificant group of patients that occur in a pulmonary clinic on a regular basis with a history of in intermittent cough, intermittent shortness of breath, borderline pulmonary function tests, and they get treated with variable enthusiasm with a beta uh, blocker, give and take this pump when you want to use it. There's not a focused attempt at treating them. And that is one of the key areas that we have been able to show that by looking at regional variations, there's marked air trapping in one lobe, not in the other lobe. So while the lung function test of the mouth gets averaged out and you miss the information, there really is some significant abnormality. The other thing that we've come to use quite standardly is the methacodine challenge test done in the CT scanner. This, as you know, induces bronchial constriction. Asthmatics are more sensitive, and you can directly measure the subsegmental and segmental airways. You can look at the lung parenchyma for CT attenuation, uh, look at the air trapping, pre and post methacholine, and then we can actually give a quantitation. We have a histogram that we can use. So here are some images taken from a patient showing an airway that is segmented by the CAD technique. This is an automatic segmentation a routine that runs, identifies the airway, measures the lumen, and here you see at the very same slice uh, post-constriction of the central uh, airway. And here we begin to see that there are different forms of asthma, those that affect the central or more proximal airways and those that affect more distally. The lung attenuation curve is nothing more than a frequency histogram of pixels taken through a region of interest. That region can be a small focal area, it can be an entire lung segment, a lobe, or the entire lung. Obviously, we feel the power is in regional assessments, and we know that we can now develop uh, a, a algorithms that study and identify normal versus abnormal, and here you see what happens in a normal subject. The frequency distribution pre-methacholine this is just the uh, distribution of pixels, in this particular case, in the upper lobe, and then following methacholine, and then following post-bronchodilator. Very nice reproducibility, and this is work that we've published, showing that there's an excellent reproducibility of the technique and that normals do not show any more shift of the curve. There is a little bit of a shift, and that has been determined as being about up to 10%. If you shift more than 10% in a region, we now have a very nice quantifiable test for air trapping. This is a classic asthmatic, and here you see, of course, the marked shift uh, to lower attenuation, post-methacholine in red, and then good reversal back uh, almost to baseline after the bronchodilator in green. And then we can look at uh, the lung. Here's the pre- and, and post-studies. You can see how there are areas of marked regional air trapping become exaggerated, and that's what the lung attenuation curve is telling you. Now, the eye can often see it, but quantitating it is not easy to do with the eye. That's the strength of the CAD technique. You can also take the frequency distribution and plot the cumulative frequency, uh, and what that does for you is shows uh, the cumulative uh, number of pixels in the distribution of interest, and again, you can see pre- and post-methacholine, the shift that occurs. So in summary, there's a very nice quantifiable test which is based on the shift of a lung attenuation curve that is reproducible, has cut points for normal versus abnormal, and can now be used to identify regions of air trapping. So what are the contexts that this is used? The one is in the clinical context and the other is in drug trial efficacy trials. Here's an example of a patient that's part of an ongoing cohort in our institution uh, and that we take on to uh, the study in the classic setting. 62-year-old presents with a 20-year history of cough and shortness of breath with a varying response to bronchodilators. Pulmonary function tests show moderate obstruction, no reversibility to bronchodilator, 
and the CT scan you've all read is showing emphysema. This patient was labeled as an emphysematous patient, and certainly there was a smoking history. Um, there was some periodicity, which is why beta blockers were used, uh, sorry, beta agonists were used. But the bottom line of the story is that we know that some patients respond to steroids and some don't in emphysema. And who are those patients? Well, what we would do to that patient is bring the patient back for a dynamic CT. The patient is scanned at FRC and residual volume under spirometric control, is given pre and post methacholine challenge, and we would then segment the lungs, and here you see the green and gold of the Australian rugby team, to my chagrin, and here you see the um, shift of attenuation curves. Here you see the baseline, then you see following the methacholine challenge, a real shift, almost like those asthmatics we've already seen, and then after the uh, treatment, there is some improvement but not completely. Nevertheless, this patient clearly had a degree of hyperreactivity. And so this patient was diagnosed as a patient with COPD and a mixture of emphysema and asthma. And that's the whole point of the reclassification that is going on uh, through the American Thoracic Society in looking at COPD. This is a patient who does benefit from aggressive steroid management, but you don't have to do a trial of steroids on everybody now, because those of you who remember your clinical days, when you give those steroids, they all come back extremely happy from the steroid psychosis, but nothing actually improves. And you never know whether you're doing a good job or not, but if you can identify through regional functional assessment, you now have a clear management plan. Let me tell you about one of the early tr uh, trials that we did uh, at the request of the FDA, when there was a tremendous debate about whether a component uh, known as CFC-BDP was a small airway bronchodilator, and did it really have efficacy? And part of the problem here was that the conventional trials had shown mixed results. In some patients, it was responding, in others, it was not. So the purpose of our trial was to use the CT technique as the primary outcome variable, uh, a greater reduction in regional air trapping would show that obviously the degree of bronchoconstriction is less, and also the degree of hyper-responsiveness. If you give the drug and then you give the patient pre- and post-methacholine CT studies, is there less of a change in those curves because you've attenuated the hyper-responsiveness? Basically, 29 patients went through a classic double-blind trial. They received the two drugs, and HRCT was performed at residual volume before and after methacholine challenge uh, at baseline and then four weeks after treatment. Small group of patients, they were well matched for age, they had very mild asthma, this was the point, these were mild, clearly defined asthmatics. There was no question that these patients were asthmatic and had mild asthma. The question was, were the small airways the role, uh, playing their bigger role than the more central airways because it turns out that asthma appears to be a big bag of mixed uh, etiologies, and it's very important that you know whether you target the peripheral small airway if that patient has, in fact, small airway hyperresponsiveness rather than whether conventional drugs work on the central airways. And so you see here the uh, outline of the trial, just to show you the CTs were done after a full range of conventional pulmonary function tests, and then thereafter. So here's the patient on the conventional agent, the CFC, uh, just an example of a patient. Here's the baseline study, pre and post methacholine. Clearly there's some air trapping. Here's the baseline, uh, pre and post methacholine after four weeks of treatment. And what you see is that this patient at baseline and four weeks later still had significant shift of the curve to the left, a shift to lower attenuation, evidence for air trapping going on with methacholine. Here's an example of a subject from the um, HFA. Again, your set of images, baseline pre and post, follow-up uh, pre and post. And when you look at the attenuation curves, very nicely shown is that, in fact, this delta that occurred has been attenuated completely. And so, in fact, the overall attenuation uh, in change in uh, Hounsfield units quantified by a number but to be honest, it's really the curves that we use for the analysis, very like the flow volume loop in many ways. And here are just a further data set to show that the change in responsiveness and the bottom line of the story is that quite clearly there was an attenuation of treatment of the peripheral small airways with the CFC particle that went to the lower 
airway level, and you were able to show that very nicely, even though pulmonary function test did not show it by using the CT technique. One of the questions was, well, what about the central airways? We were trying to identify patients with peripheral small airway disease, and here you see that, in fact, in this cohort of patients, there is um, some constriction pre and post methacholine, but it was the same for the two groups. So the degree of central involvement was about the same, but the amount of peripheral involvement was what was attenuated by the novel treatment. <clears throat> Just to show that, of course, we went through the um, comparison with conventional ways of doing this, um, and that, in fact, the one thing that correlated well with the CT was the diary that the patient kept. Pulmonary function tests did not support the CT findings, but the patient's improvement in the CFC group was also significantly better. So there was good correlation between an imaging quantitation test and, on the other hand, an objective measure of patient symptoms. Let me tell you about a study that's just come out of the feasibility stage into NIH funding, and this is um, CAT antigen. Well, it turns out that I think we all know that some of us, including myself, we go and visit grandma, get allergy, and it's a great excuse for leaving early. That CAT antigen occurs quickly, we get tight, we excuse ourselves and leave. That's certainly how I did it. But what is also clear is that patients who've been exposed to CAT antigen tend to suddenly later in the week get an exacerbation of their symptoms again, or they get exposed not to CAT but to some other stimulant and get an exacerbation. So there's been a long-held theory or question that in fact the CAT antigen response is not just acute, but has a delayed effect, which is in fact not the conventional uh, thought process. And so we raised the hypothesis that in fact what was going on was that the lung function tests were once again missing the fact that there was small airway hyperresponsiveness way delayed after the initial response and that this was identifiable by the CT technique and not by pulmonary function techniques. We've just finished the pilot study that thankfully led to some real funding of 10 asthmatic patients with known cat-induced asthma. The subjects were given a cat room challenge. A very scientific study, this, I want you to know. There's a house in Los Angeles with about 27 cats, all living in a room, and you take your subject, you measure their lung function tests, you coax them into the, la into the room, and when they knock at the window saying that they're feeling a little tight, you bring them out, because we're very ethical researchers in California, and you then measure their lung function tests. Sadly, this did not meet all of the IRB requirements, and so we've needed to uh, take this one step further, and I'll tell you about what we're doing in, the, in that regard in a moment. So we use classic uh, asthmatics, 18 to 65. They all had to have evidence that they had cat-induced uh, asthma. And we wanted a naturalistic challenge. You, know, you can buy little vials of pseudo-cat antigen, the felled one, but what the heck, you might as well use the real stuff and see what happens. And we obviously want to make sure they had no other increased hyperresponsiveness going on in the background, so no recent upper respiratory tract infection, they weren't smokers, et cetera, and et cetera. So here we have one of our own now cats, and we are, we've become the most popular purchaser of cats for animal research because our cats get to hang out in a room where all those other poor cats who normally get identified for those horrendous neurophysiology experiments and get little probes put in. When we arrive to purchase a cat, it's like the cats seem to know we're here because our cats arrive, they are now housed in our cat, cat room, uh, at the UCLA animal facility, and all around them are these poor animals going through horrendous other experiments. Well, our cats, their only job is to sit there for the next few years and have enough cat antigen for our study. And so this is the protocol that's been put together. Patients undergo full pulmonary function tests and a CT study with methacodine challenge at 8 a.m. Uh, of day one, and then they come back at 4 p.m. and they get full pulmonary function tests and another CT scan. The reason for this is to get baseline of the diurnal variation. As you all well know, asthma can strike at different times of the day. They then go visit our cats, and uh, we know what the measurement of cat dander is. There's a little bit of science going on in the background. We do have accurate measures of the uh, cat um, antigen. And they get spirometry. We do give them albuterol so they should feel better. And then what they do is they come back to us six hours later, 
and they get full pulmonary function tests and a CT study, just a single CT scan, not pre and post methacholine, uh, because we think the signal is so powerful that we don't need to do the pre and post methacholine. And then they hang out in our clinical research center for the night and come back to us at 8 o'clock in the morning, 22 hours later, for, pull, for full function tests and CT. Our initial cohort shows you here that 31-year uh, age, uh, mostly female, 6 out of 10, and asthma duration about 20 years, well known to have cat antigen exposure, uh, hypersensitivity. And you see that their pulmonary function tests do exactly what you expect them to do. They're pretty much at the 100% of uh, predicted FEV1. You take them to cat room challenge, and lo and behold, for the vast majority of them, functions go down. That's in keeping with their clinical symptomatology. But then within about six hours, for the vast majority of them, except for this one patient, most of them returned very much towards the 100% mark, which is over here. Certainly at 22 hours, there was no lung function conventional abnormality. Same for small airway functions. These are always problematic because FEF measurements are difficult to standardize, but the same story, return to normal at 22 hours. Let me show you the CT data. Uh, what happened here is here's the pre-baseline uh, study. Here they go to the cat room and they get their six hour post CRC scan, the lung attenuation or cumulative frequency curve is clearly shifted to lower attenuation. And then in many of our cases, and this is just an example from one case, by 22 hours, there was almost return, just like the lung function test, to baseline. But when we look at the pre and post methacholine, the red is baseline. This is the post methacholine curve. So we gave the methacholine. There was a shift to lower attenuation. Then although it looks like this curve is almost back to normal, actually when we give the methacholine, a marked hyper-responsiveness was still present. And actually this is work uh, from um, uh, others uh, our group, uh, these patients also, to let you know that they're very fine research subjects, they also undergo bronchoscopy, these patients, for uh, cell counts. But this is based on some work in collaboration with uh, Colorado, where there's no question that there's a peripheral airway and central airway collection of eosinophils that after treatment resolves. So there's clearly small airway delayed, uh, there's clearly small airway inflammation uh, or eosinophil infiltrate as a sign of hypersensitivity, and it occurs at both the small and large airways. And when you look at measuring those measures from the BAL lavage, you see that in fact, there is in, that, that response is attenuated over time. So there's good biological evidence for the small airway involvement, but only the CT regional technique is able to give you a quantifiable measure that conventional pulmonary function tests cannot do for you. So overall, uh, we felt that this was a good evidence for the CT technique, and now we have a further study that's underway looking at exacerbations in asthma. Can we predict which are the patients that are going to get an exacerbation by looking at delayed small airway disease? Now, although the uh, program says I'm going to shift from asthma to restrictive lung disease, I am going to, in fact, continue on obstructive lung disease, and we're going to talk about emphysema. This is, again, a very well-established part of radiology. We're all used to diagnosing emphysema. We got very excited a few years ago with CT because we were beginning to find areas where we could tell our pathologists we don't need them anymore. The CT is the new pathologist. Sadly, that's not tr shown to be itself as true as we wanted it to be. But one thing is very true. Uh, we can diagnose CT uh, in We can diagnose emphysema on CT, but there are a lot of therapeutic trials going on. Uh, some of you may know that uh, mice were shown to respond to retinoic acid. A mouse model of emphysema was given some retinoic acid, and lo and behold, the emphysema disappeared. It's not surprising that the tobacco industry thought that this was extremely interesting research and gave a lot of money in part of the settlement agreements towards uh, therapeutic treatments for emphysema funded through both the NIH and the tobacco-related disease boards. But the question was, how to find techniques to do this, and so CT came into focus there. Secondly, lung volume reduction surgery is something else that um, has been used uh, to treat patients with emphysema, but now people are saying, why do we need to do marked surgery when we can place a valve that's a one-way valve that occludes a distal segment, 
or maybe we can uh, do some other physiologic manipulation through the bronchoscope. There are a lot of trials going on right now, and many centers have been involved in these studies, both in the community as well as in academic practices. And this is the real role now of quantitative image analysis in emphysema. So what do we do here? Well, the most famous of these measures is the density mask. Uh, Nesta Muller and team um, put this forward actually in the late 80s and early, uh, and early 90s again. And what they found is that if you count the number of pixels below minus 9, 10 Hounsfield units, it had a very good correlation with uh, pathology estimation for emphysema. Sadly, this was for the holes, and a lot of these treatments are looking for the borderline diseased areas. Also, there's not a total agreement as to what that threshold should be, but there clearly is some guidelines. You can also measure it lobe by lobe. If you want to do low bar or lung volume reduction surgery, you want to identify exactly which segment or lobe you want to do this treatment to. And so what's important is to separate, first of all, heterogeneous from homogeneous disease, and you need to be able to measure the lung volumes, and you have to measure uh, lobe volumes. And thankfully, CT measured lung volumes correlate extremely well with body plethysmography. This was a paper published by our group a while back. There's been several since confirming that there's about a 0.96 correlation. So we know that we're getting good lung volumes. This is what the clinical radiologist is used to doing, reassuring or guiding the surgical team that this is a case of fairly homogeneous disease. Keep these images in your mind because while they look, and I think they project reasonably well, that there's the same amount of emphysema throughout the lung, the real question is, what does that mean to the function of that lung? Do all patients who have this appearing lung destruction really have the same functional abnormality? And then there's the heterogeneous disease that we're all looking for for the upper lobe uh, surgery. And uh, we can now take this one step forward and quantify this with uh, CAD techniques uh, using thin section techniques. And here the pixels in uh, orange. I'm not sure what sporting team that is now, actually. But the orange uh, tells us very nicely which of the pixels are below a certain threshold. And on thin section, we tend to use around minus 950. On a thicker section, still about minus 910. And we can count these up and get a quantifiable measure. Here's an example of a report that we would produce in a study looking for upper, middle, and lower lobe, the heterogeneity score, which is how much of the lung lobe is destroyed. If there's 70% involvement, that's a score of three in this particular trial. We can count the number of pixels. We have a lot of objective measures. And here you see an um, endoluminal valve that's been placed following CT targeting of the lobe that was felt to most likely benefit. This is a lobe thought to not only have structural destruction, but not be participating in ventilation. And once the valve is placed, this is the, almost the entire upper lobe collapsed down. This is the effect effectively lung volume reduction surgery, but done in a minimally invasive technique. This is one of the areas of tremendous interest. In the final phases, let's just talk about dynamic scanning. Uh, if you take a patient with fast detector scanners and using the original model that we used, which was the lung transplant patient, because we had the ability of having one lung that we knew was really bad with emphysema and another lung that was thought to be relatively normal, the transplant lung, and here again, lung function tests, not very good at discriminating. If the lung transplant lung is working reasonably well, very hard to know whether early changes are occurring. But what you can do with a dynamic study is you can get the patient to trigger through that, um, the triggered spirometer in the scanner and acquire images uh, every half second for three seconds. Uh, you can then segment out the lobes and you can plot curves. And let me just show you that this is uh, in red, the flow volume loop of a normal subject. Uh, this is uh, the change of Hounsfield unit uh, over time, a so-called Hounsfield unit time curve plotted uh, from those rapid acquired scans through a region of interest. And you see a very nice steep uprise. I want to reassure you that this is not the same research fellow. This here is our emphysema patient. And here you see that the flow volume loop shows a quite a long tail. But you can see that in the native lung, uh, the emphysematous lung, almost no airflow at all until very late, a slight increase in the Hounsfield unit time curve. And so we've used that in several studies, one of which was uh, looking for which patients should get stenting post uh, lung transplant. Uh, here you see very nicely that the native lung, 
It doesn't change pre and post the intervention, but here's their intervention. Pre-intervention, this patient had some fall off in small airway function, negative bronchoscopies. What was going on? What was going on was an abnormality at the site of the surgical uh, anastomosis. There was some dynamic collapse of the airway. Once the stent was put in, you see how the dynamic flow returns to a very normal pattern. And finally, here are two cases that look remarkably the same. These would be scored as having the same degree of emphysema. And here's a third patient with very similar situation. But what you see here is that while the structure looks about the same, so you would say this patient has moderately severe emphysema, you might even quantitate it at a certain percentage, when you do those dynamic curves, take the patient at TLC, blow them down to residual volume, plot the rate of change of Hounsfield unit, you see that for this patient, both lungs empty at about the same rate. So in this case, structure and function are correlating well. But in this patient, you can see that the one lung actually empties quite nicely, while the other lung does not. So if this was a patient with upper lobe predominant disease, which side would you do the lung volume reduction surgery? Which side would the valve go in? And the early work in this direction would be that you would target the functionally impaired lobe, which tends to make sense. So this is the point about structure and function coming together. So in conclusion, I think that the era of structural and functional imaging has arrived. It does improve both the characterization and detection of obstructive lung disease. As of today, there are many vendors that have add-on software packages that we tend to kind of ignore. It's always that added cost that we want to stick away from. I think you have to look at who your clinicians are. If you have a big thoracic practice, particularly surgical practice or interventional pulmonary practice, then these techniques really open up new areas for imaging. Thank you very much.